Revelation chapter 21 verse 3 says, And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, our beautiful word came into being because of the powerful words that you have spoken at the very beginning of time. You have created everything that is good, that we may have joy and satisfaction in our lives, and that we may have a wonderful relationship with you. But Lord, we mess things up. We ignore your commands and got swayed by the lies of the enemy. But thank you, Lord, that even in our pride, ignorance, and disobedience, you made a way to restore that broken relationship by sending us a mediator through your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that we have a Savior who will always be with us. The thought that you care for us so much and that you are familiar with all our ways is just too lofty for us to understand but truly we constantly feel and experience your love care compassion protection and provision in our lives and for this we are so grateful and so lord armed with your promises we start this 2021 with confidence in our hearts that you will once again show us your favor as you have done so in the past. We may have been hard-pressed, sidetracked, and distracted by the many events that have shaken our world in the year gone by. But thank you, Lord, for bringing us back on our feet every time we lost sight of you. Direct our steps, O Lord, that we may walk in step with the Holy Spirit, that we may walk in righteousness, that we may discern evil and avoid falling for the traps set by the enemy of our souls. As we start afresh, we pray for your anointing on us, Lord, as we leave to you all our personal plans, burdens, and concerns. Have mercy on our families, Lord, and mend whatever needs fixing, our health, our finances, our pains, and heartaches. As a church, we ask that you make us good stewards of all that you have gifted us with. May you give us wisdom on how to use our resources for your glory. May your church be a beacon of light to all who are lost and in need of direction. May we reflect your peace and the hope that we have to a world which desperately needs your presence and healing in their lives. Remind us always, Lord, to pray for our leaders as they head the fight against this pandemic that has taken our world by storm. We are grateful for the vaccines that have been manufactured in record time and pray that it will be eradicate COVID-19 for good and bring no ill side effects to those who will be injected with it. Change us, Lord, for the better. May this year see us attempting great things for you, Lord. May we have this burning desire to honor you in everything we do. May we act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly because of the goodness that you have shown us. May we be a holy people. May we stand up for your glorious truths. May we be found faithful and true to you, Lord, until the end. Thank you for your promise of eternal life through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Giving is a form of worship. 
let us give in proportion to what God has blessed us with, and not just with the leftovers. This means that giving to God takes priority over other things on which we can spend our money on. For your tithes and offerings, you may send it through online banking and deposit the amount to the following accounts of GCF North Incorporated. Union Bank Banco de Oro or Bank of the Philippine Islands. You may also bring your tithes and offerings and drop it into the offering box at the office during office hours from Tuesday to Sunday, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the second floor of New Domain Plaza, 19 Holy Spirit Drive, Don Antonio Heights, Barangay Holy Spirit, Quezon City. Please always remember the following tips for your safety and protection using online banking. For proper accounting, please send a photo of the deposit slip or confirmation receipt to Sister I.E. De Jesus via Messenger. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you for giving us the gift of abundant eternal life. Father, Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from you alone. Your generosity overflows to us. Everything that we have is a blessing from you. As your faithful stewards, we are simply giving back to you a portion of the rich bounty which you have entrusted to us. May our gifts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our God. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks, and honor and power, and strength be to our God forever and ever. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture reading is found in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. Again, that is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. May God bless the reading of his word. A blessed New Year greeting to everyone. The year 2020 has been a rather difficult year for all of us. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought much fear, worry, and anxiety in the hearts and minds of people. The community quarantine or lockdown has brought much of the economy to a standstill with many people losing their jobs and uh, the businesses of others failing or being shut down. Many churches have closed their doors uh, to regular worship gatherings and are conducting their various ministries online. We are waiting the arrival of a vaccine which promises to provide immunity for everyone so that we can bring the pandemic to a halt and uh, go back to living our former normal lives, if that were possible. Even then, it seems that we are not yet seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. As of now, the coronavirus has mutated into a highly transmissible uh, variant and is spreading rapidly in many countries. We still do not know how big of a problem it will develop into if it should enter our country. It may just be a matter of time before it gets here. A quote which I saw on the internet recently caught my attention. It reads, as we start the new year, let's get down on our knees to thank God we're still on our feet. I said to myself, what a timely reminder as we begin the new year. We should be praying and thanking God that in spite of the difficult year that we've been through, we're still here. We're still on our feet. 
God has faithfully cared for us, shielded us, sustained us, and provided for us in times of our need. And seeing that our troubles are far from over, with the coronavirus still on the loose, we need to keep on getting back on our knees to ask God for protection and safekeeping. We need to consistently engage in prayer for ourselves, our families, our church, our community, and our nation. Born out of the ongoing crisis which we are all experiencing, our theme for this year has been conceived with this in mind. Pray, persevere, prevail. This is our church theme in 2021. Prevailing in any endeavor is the end goal, but it is not all human effort. Ultimately, we need the hand of God because He is sovereign and He makes things happen. Prayer, therefore, is a must. As we pray, we must remain steadfast and continue trusting God in 2021 amidst the troubling times. This is what it means to persevere. Our God is able and we can count on Him to enable us to prevail, but we must keep our faith in Him. Thus, we are starting off our sermon series for this month on the topic of prayer. Our theme for January is the church that prays. We usually begin our year with a day of prayer held on the first Saturday uh, of the first month. But since our church is still not doing any physical face-to-face -face gatherings, we will instead hold a night of prayer this coming Wednesday at 7 in the evening via Zoom. Please come and join us as we pray and intercede for our families, our church, our community, and our nation. We'll be using the same Zoom link that we use in the midweek prayer meeting. Today we will be looking at the book of 1 Timothy. Did you know that most of the books that comprise the New Testament are actually letters? These letters, also known as epistles, contain both general and both general Christian teaching and specific instructions for the congregations to which they were addressed. First, Timothy is one of Paul's pastoral letters. These letters were addressed to the church leaders and outlined their pastoral duties. This one was written to Timothy, the pastor in Ephesus, who had worked and traveled extensively with the Apostle Paul. It was most likely written in AD 62 and 66, or between AD 62 and 63. In his letter, Paul urges Timothy to remain in Ephesus to put a stop to, false, to the false teachings that are spreading and to maintain spiritual discipline within the church. Paul also includes many instructions about the administration of the church. From his concerns about false teachers in chapter 1, Paul turned to the matters or to matters relating to the conduct of the church in chapter 2. Paul began with what he considered most important, prayer. What too often comes last in a church's priorities should actually come first. One of God's great plans for the church is to be a place of prayer. In Mark 11, chapter 17, or Mark 11, verse 17, Christ described the temple as a house of prayer. And he was teaching to them and saying, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. In the same way, believers are the temple of God, both individually and corporately. Therefore, we should be characterized by prayer. However, if we are honest, most of us struggle with prayer. We struggle with both how to pray and taking time to pray. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1-6, to 6, we learn the characteristics of praying churches. Through the context, or though the context is public worship, most of these truths apply to our private prayer lives as well. Now, what are the characteristics of a praying church which can be observed from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 6? First, praying churches prioritize prayer. Why does Paul say, first of all, when beginning his instructions on prayer? He seems to be demonstrating 
the priority of prayer in corporate church life. He uses the word urge to further emphasize its importance. The church should prioritize prayer as should individual Christians. We see the early church's priority of prayer in the book of Acts. Consider the following verses. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. And then in Acts chapter 6, Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. The early church devoted themselves to prayer. And the apostles prioritized it, even over serving needy widows. They needed to give attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This must be our priority as a church and as individual believers. Oswald Chambers once said, Prayer does not fit us for the greater word. It is the greater word. For this reason, prayer must be our priority. Why does God require us to pray, especially since He is sovereign? God originally made man to have dominion over the earth. Adam and Eve were given the job of ruling over and caring for His creation as His vice regents. A vice regent is a deputy, a person who acts in the place of a ruler, governor, or sovereign. Thus God told Adam and Eve that they were to subdue the earth and have dominion over it, not by abusing it, but by working it and keeping it. It was through man that God would rule and build his kingdom. Even though man fell, that is still God's method on the earth. He works both through the prayer of man and the work of the hands of man. Moreover, God will not complete his works apart from man's prayers. Consider Ezekiel chapter 22, verses 30 to 31. I look for someone among them who will beat up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it, but I found no one. So I will pour out my wrath on them and consume them with my fiery anger, bringing down on their own heads all they have done declares the Sovereign Lord. For lack of prayer, God destroys nations, governments, and individuals. God is always looking for people to pray within His church. But like Israel before us, we often fail to pray. Instead of prioritizing prayer, we prioritize family, money, education, entertainment, and even other ministries at the expense of those around us. In worship, prayer must be the church's priority, and it must also be a priority in our individual lives. And then, bring churches pray for everyone. Paul says that requests, prayers, intercessions, and thanks be offered on behalf of all people. One of the things we can discern about prayer from this verse is that all people need prayer. There is not one person we know that doesn't need constant grace from God, and therefore, our prayers. What do the various types of prayer that Paul mentions mean? Let's look at them one by one. Supplication, petition, or request are synonymous words. This kind of prayer arises from a sense of need it essentially refers to asking God for something. Now certainly, our prayers should not only include requests, but when we do offer them, we should have confidence that God cares for us and wants to give us His best. Next, prayer. Prayer is a general word or word for all communication with God. Unlike supplications, it is only use of God in the Bible. Therefore, it includes a unique element of worship and reverence. Intercession. This word comes from a root word meaning to plead in behalf of another or to intervene. It refers to requests 
made on behalf of others. Therefore, it, it is not only a word of advocacy, but also of empathy, sympathy, compassion, and involvement. Thanksgiving refers to a basic sense of gratitude for God's grace. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 calls for us to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for our lives. And each of these types of prayers must be offered for all people. Sadly, our prayers tend to only focus on our friends, family, and maybe our church. John Stott said this about the public prayer offered in a church he once visited. Some time ago, I attended public worship in a certain church. The pastor was absent on a holiday and a lay elder led the pastoral prayer. He prayed that the pastor might enjoy a good vacation, which was fine, and that two lady members of the congregation might be healed, which was also fine. We should pray for the sick. But that was all. The intercession can hardly have lasted 30 seconds. I came away saddened, sensing that this church worship a little village god of, the, of their own devising. There was no recognition of the needs of the world and no attempt to embrace the world in prayer. This is a picture of not only what's common in public prayer, but also our individual prayer. We commonly forget that we are part of a larger body of Christ and ultimately part of an entire world of people. In Ephesians 6.18, Paul said about this, uh, said this about prayer. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Because the church is constantly under attack from the evil one, we as believers should constantly lift up local churches and churches all over the world. They need our prayers. And the reality is because we are all part of Christ's body, they always affect us and we affect them. The parts of the body are attached and therefore dependent upon one another. This should encourage us to continually pray for other churches to prosper. Now, how can we practice prayer for all people? Number one, we can pray for all people generally. Obviously, we don't know all people. However, we can pray generally for the salvation of the lost. Some, some people might question the validity of a prayer for the salvation of all men. Paul defended his instructions by pointing out that such prayer is good and pleases God, our Savior. Many prayers are unacceptable to God, but not this one. The reason this prayer is acceptable to God is that it is a prayer according to His will. God, who is by nature a Savior, wants all men to be saved. God desires that no one should perish, that the entire human race come to know the truth through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Of course, not all do come to salvation. The Bible says that for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Matthew 7, 14. In a spirit of compassion and with a desire to please God, we should pray for all people. Many of them are still without Christ. Number two, we can pray for all people specifically. As we learn about the needs of individuals, groups of people, and churches, we then can pray specifically. Now, how can we learn more about people's needs. We can begin by asking for their prayer requests so our prayers can be more informed. In our church, we have the internet prayer ministry wherein one can request for prayers for the sick, for those needing comfort and strength, for those needing guidance or provisions and more. Also, many prayer ministries provide information about unreached people groups who need prayer. One such ministry is called Global Prayer Digest. You can subscribe and receive daily emails about these groups and how to pray for them. Our very own CBAP missions 
also has its own prayer bulletin for the least rich people groups in the Philippines and in the world. Likewise, Open Doors International offers subscriptions via email if you would like to partner with them in prayer as they minister to persecuted Christians worldwide. Another characteristic of a praying church is this. Praying churches pray specifically for authorities. In uh, Timothy chapter 2, verses 2 to 3, Paul goes from prayer generally for all people to specific prayers for those in leadership. He says, for kings and all who are in authority that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This would have been a tremendous challenge to the Christians living in Ephesus. At this time, the, em the Emperor Nero was ruling in Rome. He spearheaded a wave of persecution against Christians. He would light Christians on fire in order to brighten his garden. He would put slabs of meat on Christians in the amphitheater and sent lions after them for sport. However, Paul does not tell these Christians to rebel, protest, or fight for their rights. He calls them to pray for their authorities. Romans 13 verse 1 says this about our authorities. Everyone must submit to governing authorities. For all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. All authorities, even ungodly ones, are established by God. They are God's servant to reward the good and punish the bad. And because of this, Christians must constantly intercede for them, especially those who are evil. We must remember the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, like the rivers of water, he turns it whatever or wherever he wishes. Our God is sovereign. He can change the hearts of even the most wicked rulers. Even when kings, rulers, and politicians seem hostile and evil, Paul reminds Timothy that God wants all people to be saved through Christ. This is why Christians are called on to pray even for those who persecute them. The goal is to see souls saved, not revenge. Paul says we should pray for everyone and specifically for authorities so that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Such prayer for all is good and is pleasing before God, our Savior. With the persecution of believers in full force under Nero, Paul was greatly aware of the deteriorating political situation. Thus, he urged prayers for the salvation of all men, but especially rulers, so that the stable, non-interfering environment of the previous days might be recovered. This is the minimum requirement if Christians are to live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is not to say that Paul was trying to run away from suffering. Times of political and social upheaval are excellent times in which to die for Christ, but hard times in which to live for Him. By praying for our leaders, it can provide protection for Christians, allowing them to live holy and godly lives in society. Therefore, when the church is not praying for its leaders, it opens the door for difficult circumstances in society and anxiety in the hearts of believers. These difficult circumstances at times lead to Christians being persecuted. In a sense, believers are praying to be left alone to quietly practice their faith and to spread the gospel in peace. In addition, we should pray because, because it is morally good and pleasing to God. When believers lift up their leaders, God looks down upon them with pleasure. This should motivate believers to pray often for their leaders. Now let's talk about praying for 
spiritual leaders, leaders in the church. As we consider Paul's call to pray for authorities, we must remember to pray specifically for our spiritual leaders in the church as well. They need our prayers as they are the targets of many assaults of the enemy. When we neglect praying for them, it affects not only them, but the entire church community. Furthermore, praying for our spiritual leaders delivers us from a critical spirit. We are less likely to throw stones at somebody we constantly pray for. Charles Spurgeon, the well-known British preacher of the past century, saw thousands of people come to faith in Christ under his preaching. On one of his visits to Europe, Spurgeon met an American pastor who said, I have long wished to see you, Mr. Spurgeon, and I have some questions to ask of you. In our country, there are many opinions as to the secret of your great influence. Would you be kind enough to give me your own point of view? After a moment's pause, Spurgeon simply said, my people pray for me. Spurgeon was quick to acknowledge the value of prayer in his ministry. He knew that he would not find success without it. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of you who pray for me, the elders, the deacons, and the other spiritual leaders in our church. We are nothing without the hand of God upon us. Your prayers sustain us. We appreciate and value your prayer support very much. Maraming salamat po. Finally, praying churches pray evangelistically. Let me read 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 to 7. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith, in truth. As Paul moves from general prayer for everybody to specific prayer for leaders, he focuses on prayer for the salvation of souls. Paul says that God wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Evangelism comes from the Greek word evangelion, which means a good message or gospel. And evangelizo means to announce, declare, bring, or preach this good news. The good news is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who gave his life as a sacrifice for our sins. The fact that Paul challenges them to pray for all people's salvation implies that they were not evangelizing or that they struggled in this particular area. Two kinds of false teaching possibly hindered evangelistic efforts at Ephesus. One group were the Judaizers, who were obviously Jewish. These exclusivists in the Ephesian church, where Timothy is the pastor, evidently felt that the gospel was only for the Jews. They focused on God's saving purpose for the Jews and those who followed the law. There were also implications of Gnostic heresy. Gnostics claimed to possess an elevated knowledge, a higher truth, known only to a certain few. Gnosticism comes from the Greek word Gnosis, which means to know. Gnostics claim to possess a higher knowledge, not from the Bible, but acquired on some mystical higher plane of existence. We can discern this from Paul's declaration that Christ is the only mediator between God and man. For Gnostics, there were many mediators, and people needed this special knowledge to inherit salvation. Therefore, for the Judaizer, for the Gnostic, salvation was only for the elite group and not necessarily for everyone. 
Now, some may find controversial Paul's declaration in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, that God wants or desires all people to be saved. Some teach universal salvation through this verse. Others see conflict with the doctrine of election. Universal salvation is the view that God wants all to be saved, and therefore He runs on them all through Christ's death. Therefore, none shall ultimately perish. However, man cannot save himself. Only God can save man. This depicts the divine side of salvation. And yet, to come to the knowledge of the truth represents the human side. God doesn't save apart from the will of man. He works through man's will by providing faith to man so that man can respond to the gospel. Only those who come to the knowledge of the truth will be saved. Not everyone. In addition, although Christ's ransom was sufficient for the salvation of all, it is only applied to those who repent and accept Christ. Therefore, this verse does not teach universal salvation and neither does the rest of the scripture. As mentioned, others see a theological conflict with this verse when considering the doctrine of election, that God chose some for salvation before the creation of the world. If God desires everybody to be saved, then why didn't he elect everybody for salvation? Some people might ask. This in part can be answered by considering the difference between God's desire and his sovereign will. His sovereign will always happens as God works all things for the purpose of his will. However, his desire does not always happen. God desires that all will be saved, but scripture clearly teaches that man will be judged. In addition, we see this even as we consider our own desires and choices. We often have desires like recreational rest that at times we forego for greater reasons. There's no contradiction between God's desire and his sovereign purposes in election. As we pray for all people and for those in authority, we must constantly pray for their salvation. Again, God has chosen to build his kingdom through his people, and that includes their prayers. Now let's talk for a moment on the theology of evangelistic prayer. All prayer is ultimately based on one's theology. Bad theology leads to bad prayers or no prayers at all. Paul says, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith, and what theological truth should evangelistic prayer be based on according to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 to 7? Here they are. Number one, we should pray evangelistically because there is only one God. What does Paul mean by this? He probably says this because if there were many gods, there would be many ways to salvation. This is the pluralistic view common in the ancient world and today. There are many pathways to God, and therefore evangelism is condemned. Evangelism says that there is only one right way, and that's exactly the argument Paul makes. There aren't many gods. There is only one, and therefore only one way of salvation. Next, we should pray evangelistically because Christ is the only mediator between God and man. As mentioned, the Gnostics believe that there were many mediators between God and man, and Christ was only one of them. Therefore, Paul affirms the full deity and humanity of Christ. As God, he can relate to the Father, and as man, he can relate to us. He is our mediator, our go-between. Christ was our, was our ransom 
as he paid the penalty for our sins by dying on the cross. His death for our sins allows us to be accepted by a holy God. God now sees us through the blood and perfect righteousness of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. For that reason, only Christ can be our go-between. He is the only God. Man. Gnostic doctrine has been seen in various forms throughout church history. In Roman Catholic doctrine, saints can be our mediators with God. Paul, Mary, and other saints can intercede for us. However, Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is our only intermediary, our only mediator. Therefore, if man is going to be saved, it must be through Christ alone. Thirdly, we should pray evangelistically because sinners are saved through preaching. Paul said, For this I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. The God who chose the means of salvation also chose the method. For people are saved by others faithfully preaching the gospel to them. Paul was a preacher as he proclaimed the gospel. He was an apostle as he was sent with authority from Christ to plant churches. He was a teacher as he explained the whole counsel of God to others. The fact that he mentions his ministry to the Gentiles supports the fact that the gospel was not just for the Jews or the spiritually elite, but for all people. God desires all people to be saved. Understanding that there is only one God, one mediator, and one method for salvation should provoke us to constantly intercede for the lost. We should intercede for them while at the supermarket, on the bus, in the workplace. We should also intercede for God to send laborers into the harvest field to preach the gospel. God desires that none should perish, but that all would come to repentance. Pray for your friends and loved ones who have yet to know Christ. And then pray to God for boldness that he may empower you to share the gospel. Jesus constantly prayed as he went about doing ministry. He depended on the power of God and the Holy Spirit for the work at hand. After his resurrection and ascension, the disciples did not immediately go out and proclaim the good news of salvation to the people. They gathered and engaged in much prayer. They waited for the empowering of the Holy Spirit. After the coming of the Holy Spirit, they continued to pray. This is our calling as well. We must be a praying church. What are some practical ways wherein you can engage in the ministry of prayer? Number one, have a regular personal time with God in prayer and in His Word. We often call this the quiet time. Choose which part of the day is more convenient for you. It could be early in the morning, at noon, or at night. Spend time with God and develop intimacy with Him. And then, join our midweek prayer meeting. We're currently holding our weekly prayer meeting via Zoom. Please send me a private message if you wish to become a regular member of our Prayer Warriors group chat. I also would like to invite you to join our night of prayer this coming Wednesday. Let us gather together and pray as one body in Christ. Join the 24-hour prayer chain. We have a prayer chain network in our church. Each hour of the day is covered in prayer by volunteers for the various concerns of our families, our church, and the nation. Please send me a private message if you wish to join this group. And then sign up to receive the regular internet prayer items. We post daily prayer items via text messaging and through Messenger. These are a combination of prayer items besides the requests for healing, for 
for comfort, for strength, for provisions, and other urgent personal concerns from members. Please let me know if you would like to receive these items regularly. Let me now close in prayer for all of us. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of prayer. We can boldly approach your throne of grace anytime because we have a special relationship with you. We are your children and you are our father. We can present to you our requests, our thanksgivings, as well as our intercessions for others. We declare that we are nothing without you. All that we have and all that we are able to do is only by your grace and through your enabling power in our lives. Help us to become a church that prioritizes prayer over other ministries. Enable us to be mighty and strong in prayer. We pray that you will have mercy on our friends and loved ones, that they will be open to the gospel. We pray that you will grant wisdom to our government leaders and others in authority that they may lead well. May they also come to know Jesus. Finally, may we not just pray for others to be saved, but that we also will do our part in sharing Jesus to them so that they too may receive forgiveness and eternal life that is found in Christ alone. We pray this in the name of the only Savior, your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. Today is the first Sunday of the month and we will be observing Communion Sunday. Communion or the Lord's Supper is a time when we commemorate the life and death of our Lord Jesus Christ who gave up His life for our sake. Let us pause for a moment and examine ourselves for any unconfessed sins. Let us ask God to reveal those sins to us. Let us confess those sins to Him and let us ask for forgiveness. Let us pause for a brief moment of silence. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, that we might be forgiven of our sins. Lord, we ask for forgiveness for those sins which we have committed against you. And Lord, we pray that you would forgive us for those sins. And Lord, we thank you for your promise that if we confess our sins to you, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me now read what the Apostle Paul wrote in the book of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, starting from verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Please get your biscuit or your wafer. This wafer is the symbol of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave up for us. Let's lift the wafer and all together say, Thank you, Jesus, for your body that you gave up for me. Let's partake. Please get your cups. This cup is the symbol of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ which he shed on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Let's lift the cup and all together say, Thank you, Jesus, for your blood that you shed for me. Let us drink. Let us pray. Father, once again, we thank you for sending your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, came into the world, died on the cross, that we might receive the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, thank you for the gift of eternal life. Thank you for forgiveness. Help us to live for you. 
to walk according to your will, to grow, and to give you glory in our lives, even as we await the coming again of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Hear the calls and hunger for the day when we cry. 